The Senate is about to begin their day. A quick reminder that our complete coverage of the British phone hacking investigation is available on our website, cspan.org. The U.S. Senate is continuing work today on a bill aiming to reduce domestic violence. At about 11.30 this morning, lawmakers will turn to a pair of judicial nominations with votes on those expected at about noon Eastern. Live now to the Senate floor giving the prayer today is televangelist Joel Osteen. Senate will come to order. Today's opening prayer will be offered by Reverend Joel Osteen, senior pastor of the Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. Thank you, Senator. Let us pray. Father, we receive your blessings today with grateful hearts, and we thank you for the favor that you show us. As we pray for those who lead our nations, our nation, we ask that you bless this body and those who serve in it. We thank you that these lawmakers serve with honor and integrity, that you will continue to bless our nation through them. Give them wisdom as they make good decisions, courage that they'll hold fast to your truth, and compassion that all should prosper from their laws. We receive your presence here today. Pray that these lawmakers will remain mindful of you and that they will honor you in everything that they do. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., April 26, 2012. To the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Tom Udall, a senator from the state of New Mexico, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Note the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. President. Senator from Texas is recognized. Mr. President, uh, it's my pleasure the, the, to ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection, under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of S. 1925, which the clerk will report. Calendar number 312, S. 1925, a bill to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act of 1994. Senator from Texas is recognized. Mr. President, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our guest chaplain, Joel Osteen, the pastor of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. He is a native Texan and attended Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For 17 years, Pastor Osteen worked behind the scenes for his father, John, who founded Lakewood Church in 1959. In 1999, his father passed away and Pastor Osteen accepted God's call to service in the church and took over the reins as senior pastor despite having only preached once in his life. It was soon clear that this new young preacher had a natural gift for speaking and was able to personally connect with diverse audiences with the inspirational message of God's love. Since that time, he and his wife and co-pastor, Victoria, have led Lakewood through extraordinary growth. 
In 2005, the Osteens moved Lakewood Church from its original home in northwest, northeast Houston to the former home of the Houston Rockets basketball team. With this space, Pastor Osteen now delivers a message of hope and encouragement to 38,000 people a week, with millions more across the country tuning in on their televisions. Pastor Osteen has reached millions more as a best-selling author. His first book, Your Best Life Now, was re released in 2004 and remained on the New York Times bestseller list for two years. His most recent book, Every Day a Friday, offers common sense advice on how to be happy by applying the principles of God's Word to your daily life. Pastor Osteen has spoken throughout the world, and that's what brings him to the Capitol today. On Saturday, the Osteens will lead thousands in what is billed as a night of hope at National Park in Washington. That message of hope and encouragement is what has attracted me and my family to watch Pastor Osteen on Sunday mornings. And I have been to his church. He welcomed me and my daughter Bailey, whose 11th birthday is today. They welcomed me to Lakewood Church two years ago, and I got to see this awesome place that he fills every single Sunday, sometimes more than the Houston Rockets ever had, I have to say. I do want to ask uh, or say that the chaplain of the Senate, Dr. Barry Black, uh, who works with us every week here in the Senate and with all of our staffs, was wonderful to help assisting to bring Pastor Osteen to the podium to open our Senate this morning. It's a wonderful Senate tradition that we start our day by thanking God for this wonderful world and also remembering the mantle of leadership and responsibility that is on our shoulders and trying to do the very best we can with that message. So thank you, Mr. President, and I want to thank Pastor Osteen and his wife, Victoria, wonderful people that I've gotten to know through the years, and they have inspired so many of us um, in our travails of life. Thank you, and I yield the floor. Mr. President? Majority leaders. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> The Senate is now considering S. 1925, with the time until 11.30 for debate only. Republicans will control the first 45 minutes, the majority will control the second 45 minutes. At 11.30 today, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the Costa and Guatemala nominations, both nominated by United States District Judges for Texas. At noon, there will be two votes on confirmation of these nominations, where, where Senator McConnell and I are trying to work through a way to proceed on the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, and I hope to be able to um, have some announcement after the, uh, probably around 2 o'clock today. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that, that two fellows in the Office of Senator Patty Murray, Stephanie Wilkinson and Eric Brooks, be granted floor privileges for the remainder of the 112th Congress. Without objection. Mr. President. Republican leaders recognized. The Senate is now debating the Violence Against Women Act. We began debate on this legislation by consent, and we'd like to complete action on this legislation also by consent. We've been working to enter into an efficient consent agreement with only a couple of relevant amendments and very short time agreements for processing them. This approach is in keeping with how Republicans have handled VAWA in the past, this approach would also allow us to complete the bill today. And these relevant amendments would give the Senate the opportunity to strengthen the law, especially in terms of the punishment for those who commit violence against women. As my friend, the Majority Leader, noted yesterday, a good way to lower the incident of violent crime is to incarcerate those who commit it. We couldn't agree more, and we'd like the chance to improve the law in that respect. Now, Mr. President, on another and sad note, <clears throat> I rise this morning to, uh, to acknowledge the loss of an American uh, hero and patriot. It's my sad duty today to report to my colleagues that Kentucky has lost one of our finest heroes in uniform. And this particular loss 
is very personal to me. As I knew this outstanding young man very well. Captain Daniel H. Utley of the U.S. Army was killed in the North African country of Mali just a few days ago on April the 20th, 2012, while on a training mission to help local citizens combat terrorism. Dan was 33 years old. For his service to our country, Captain Utley received many medals, awards, and decorations, including the Bronze Star Medal, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Army Commendation Medal, the Joint Service Achievement Medal, the Army Achievement Medal, the Joint Meritorious Unit Award, the National Defense Service Medal, the Afghanistan Combat Medal with Combat Star, the Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal, the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, the Korean Defense Service Medal, the Army Service Ribbon, the Overseas Service Ribbon, and the NATO Medal. Captain Utley also received the basic parachutist badge and his Thailand jump wings. He was a great young man. He was a great son, says Charlie Utley, Dan's father. He always put other people ahead of himself. He did an outstanding job while he was there. He loved being in the Army. He enjoyed what he was doing, and he really thought he was making a difference. It goes without saying, Mr. President, that every man and woman in our armed forces is an American of special fortitude and character. But I can personally testify to the truth on behalf of, to that truth on behalf of Dan Utley. At my alma mater, the University of Louisville, I was very proud to have begun the McConnell Scholars Program, a rigorous and prestigious scholarship program for the finest students in Kentucky that prepares them for a lifetime of leadership and service. And Dan was one of the best McConnell scholars to ever grace the program. I couldn't agree more with what my good friend, Dr. Gary Gregg, the director of the McConnell Scholars Program, says of Dan's loss. Dr. Gregg says America has lost a rising star. Dan was born in Bowling Green, Kentucky on April 13, 1979. Raised in Glasgow, Kentucky, he went to Glasgow High School where he played soccer and was a member of the academic team. He was also a member of Glasgow's first Christian church. Dan had a lot of hobbies, but most of them had one thing in common. They did not take place inside four walls or under a roof. He loved the outdoors, remembers Dan's father, Charlie. He loved camping, hiking, biking, jumping out of airplanes, canoeing, kayaking, anything to do, anything to do with the outdoors. Dan graduated from high school in 1997, and he was awarded a McConnell Scholarship to attend the University of Louisville. Dan was a workhorse of a McConnell scholar, says Dr. Gregg. There are people who serve for title and glory. Dan was a young man who served in order to serve. When he was an undergraduate, he would volunteer for any cause that came along. He was always trying to help out the underdog. His heart was always bigger than his ego. His compassion for others always outshone his ambition for self. His life was no different in the U.S. Army. What he loved most was serving others in need. I got to know Dan very well during his time in college, and really I came to appreciate what a remarkable young man he was. He was extremely smart. He was also one of the most popular students in the program. 
Dan spent one semester in college working in the Kentucky State Legislature, helping to write bills and assisting the state senators and representatives with whatever they needed. Dan graduated from U of L in 2001 with a bachelor's degree with honors in political science. After college, for a time, he enrolled in law school, but soon decided because of his desire to serve that his path to fulfillment lay in military service. When I first met Dan, a military career was certainly not at all what I would have expected him to do. But it just goes to show you the growth and maturity this young man achieved in such a very short time. He was in law school after 9-11. And after he witnessed what happened on 9-11, he wanted to do something, says Charlie Utley. He was miserable in law school because he wanted to do something for his country. Dan's friend and fellow McConnell scholar, Connie Wilkinson Toby, agrees. This is what she said. Dan was ready to live life, and he was probably smarter than everybody sitting in law school, she says. That was not stimulating enough for him, and he was ready to do great things. And so in 2003, Dan joined the Army and went to OCS. In almost a decade of Army service, Captain Utley served in many posts, all of them challenging and proof of his skill and talent. He was stationed or deployed in South, Af uh, South Korea for 24 months, in Kuwait for 12 months, in Afghanistan for 13 months, and his final deployment in Mali lasted seven months. He served in capacities such as a tactical communications platoon leader, operations officer while in Kuwait, aide de camp for a general in the 160th Signal Brigade, and Brigade Civil Affairs Officer in the 101st Airborne. After successfully completing a Civil Affairs Qualifications course, Dan was assigned to F Company 91st Civilian Affairs Battalion Airborne as a team leader. I particularly remember when he called and told me he was being made an aide de camp and was going to get a new shoulder holster as part of his job protecting the general he served, says Dr. Gregg. It was a position of great honor, and he was humbled to have been chosen, but he wanted to talk most about his cool new sidearm. Earlier this year, the news magazine for the U.S. Agency for International Development, Frontlines, published an article about America's efforts to combat instability in Mali, one of the poorest countries in the world. The presence of the terrorist group Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which has its roots in the Algerian Civil War, now poses a threat of violent extremism in the country, the article states. That's why the U.S. Army, and specifically Captain Utley, was in Mali in the first place. As a team member on the Department of Defense's civil military support element, Captain Utley was quoted in this article on the valiant work he and his fellow soldiers were doing just a few months before his tragic death. In September 2004, Dan married Katie, also an Army officer. They had their wedding in Hawaii. Katie was commissioned through the ROTC program at the University of Georgia and is now a captain in the Army with the 82nd Airborne based out of Fort Bragg in North Carolina. Mr. President, we're thinking of Captain Dan Utley's loved ones today, especially his wife, Captain Katie Utley, his father, Charles L. Utley, his mother, Linda H. Utley, his brother and sister-in-law, Charles L. Utley II and Maria, his brother and sister-in-law, Matthew Utley and Michelle, his nephews, Matthew Ryan Utley and Mason Robert Utley, his niece, Marley Rose Utley, 
his maternal grandmother, Pauline Haynes, his parents-in-law, Chris and Peggy Michael, his brother-in-law, Matthew Michael, and many other beloved family members and friends. I also know for a fact that many faculty members at the University of Louisville, staff members for the McConnell Center, and current and former McConnell scholars will dearly miss Dan. I certainly will, Mr. President. I had the honor of watching Dan grow from a teenager to a brave and virtuous man who willingly sacrificed everything to defend his friends and his family and his country. Elaine and I extend our deepest sympathies to all who knew and loved him. And I, I would ask my Senate colleagues to join me in expressing our respect and gratitude to this fine young man, Captain Daniel H. Utley. Let our work here today serve to ensure our country never forgets the duty he fulfilled by putting on the uniform or the great sacrifice he made in a country many of us could not even find on a map in order to protect our freedoms here at home. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Under the, under the previous order, the time until 11.30 a.m. will be for debate only and will be equally divided between the two leaders or their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first 45 minutes and the majority controlling the second 45 minutes. Mr. President. Senator from Alabama is recognized. I just want to express my appreciation to the Republican leader for his remarks about Captain Udley, and I have had the honor to talk with uh, McConnell scholars on a number of occasions from Louisville. They are such a fine group of people, and I know how deeply the, uh, uh, our leaders feels this loss. And uh, I certainly would join in my expression to the family. And I recall Ad General Myers, the former chairman of Joint Chiefs, uh, when someone suggested uh, that soldiers who were injured or lost their lives were victims. He said they're not victims, they're heroes. They committed themselves to serve their country. They believe that our country is worthy of defense and are willing to put their lives on the line for it. And, and they are heroes, and certainly uh, this captain was. Mr. President, I'd just like to thank my friend from Alabama for his kind remarks about this brave young man. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, this Sunday, just a few days, April 29th, will mark the third anniversary of the last time the Democratic-led Senate has passed a budget. Since the date, that date, our nation has spent $10.4 trillion while adding $4.5 trillion to the national debt. And that's how it is that we say that nearly 40 cents of every dollar we're spending now is borrowed. So we added 10.4 trillion uh, in spending over these uh, years uh, since we've had a budget and added 4.5 trillion to the debt. We're in our fourth consecutive year of trillion dollar plus deficits and heading to the fifth year. Prior to these four years, the largest deficit we ever had was about $480 billion. We've, we've more than doubled that every year since. Uh, it's a systemic problem, not a little problem. The economy coming back it would help, no doubt, but it will not put us on a sound path. We have to make some choices. Every person in America now owes, as their share of the national debt, $45,000. $45,000 every American man, woman, and child is carrying is their burden as a result of the overspending of this con Congress. For perspective, and we need perspective because the numbers are uh, often hard to grasp, uh, the perspective is that this is larger than any of the Western world, including Greece. Our per-person debt is greater than that, than the per-person debt of Greece. Uh, yet, uh, at this time of financial crisis, the majority in the Senate refused to perform its legally required duty and moral responsibility to produce a budget plan. It's part of the United States Code, passed in 1974, and the Budget Act. 
A budget requires also, as a part of that act, uh, only 51 votes to pass. It cannot be filibustered. It's given a priority. In 1974, uh, Congress obviously was disappointed that we weren't moving forward effectively with budgets, and that a budget is crucial to the financial uh, stability of, of a nation. And that's why they passed the Budget Act. And it said you can't filibuster it in the Senate. It's guaranteed a right to have a vote. It's required to be brought up in committee by April 1st and, and move forward by April 15th. And that's what the statute requires. Unfortunately, it doesn't require uh, that Congress goes to jail if it doesn't pass it. Or perhaps, as uh, Senator Heller from, from Nevada suggests, maybe Congress ought not to be paid if they don't pass a budget. Maybe that would be a reform that would be good for us. So they even refused, uh, the majority uh, refused to bring up a budget, to even attempt to pass a budget uh, as this year, and as they've passed, refused to do the last two years, two years before that. So the absence of a budget is not simply a case of inaction. The Senate majority has pursued a systematic, deliberate and determined policy, I believe a politically driven policy, to keep a budget off the floor. Why? To shield its conference from public accountability and to attempt to uh, during this period of financial danger. The worst possible time not to have a budget, not to have a plan, not to stand up and tell the American people what your vision financially for the country is, would be in a time of deep financial crisis, when we are on an unsustainable path. Uh, so we're not evil, willing to even see a plan. Uh, they're not willing to present a financial future of America. And when criticized about it, the White House says one thing, uh, Speaker Pelosi another one, uh, the Demo Republican leader here, Democratic leader here has another explanation. None of them are coherent and none of them make real sense. Why? Well, I guess it's because there is no explanation. There can be no justifiable reason why this responsibility is not fulfilled. They said, well, maybe one day, maybe it wouldn't pass ultimately. Maybe we, we wouldn't agree, but the House, the Republican House, felt its responsibility to comply with the law, and it has for the last two years, and will, last year and will again this year, lay out a long-term plan for America that changes our debt course and puts us on a financial path to stability. And that's responsibility. Oh, yes, the Senate called it up here. For what reason? Just so they could attack it and bring it down. But not to lay out any plan of their own. And when Senator McConnell called up President Obama's budget last year, said, well, let's see, what do you want to vote for that? You voted against the uh, House budget and attacked Paul Ryan and his colleagues for the historic work they put into drafting their budget. Let's see what you think about your president's budget. It went down 97 to nothing. Not a single member voted for it. So. While government workers have been throwing lavish parties in Las Vegas, President Obama, uh, President Obama has not been roused to impose managerial discipline on this government. He has yet to call on his party running the Senate to produce a financial plan. His own budget received, this year's budget, uh, was brought up in the House and he didn't receive a single vote there. Yet both he and the Senate Democrats continue to call for higher taxes. They say we must have higher taxes. But how can they ask Americans to send more money to Washington when the Senate's majority won't even write a budget, won't even tell them where they're going to spend the money? They just say, send us more. We need more. We're not going to cut spending. Oh, we can't cut spending. That would be terrible. But you need to send us more money. 
and maybe one day uh, we'll pass a budget, maybe not. Americans shouldn't send one more dime in taxes to this dysfunctional government. They should say to Washington, you lay out a plan that puts us on a sound financial uh, path. You bring wasteful spending to a conclusion. You quit spending money on cylinders and hot tubs in Las Vegas. Then you talk to me about sending more money. That's what the American people need to say. That's what they are saying. That's what they said in 2010, I thought, pretty clearly. But the message has not been received. National Reviews, Rich Lowry uh, recently wrote, quote, Senator Conrad, that's our fine budget chairman, our Democratic chairman, um, said it was too hard to pass a budget in an election year. Close quote. Uh, well, so that was the argument. One of the arguments was, well, we just no need to bring up a budget. It's an election year. We don't want to be having to vote before we have to be voted on by the American people. They might not like the way we voted. They might vote us out of office. They might be disappointed in us if they saw us actually take tough votes on what we're going to have to do about the future of the republic. And uh, Mr. Lowry goes on, quote, but Senate Democrats hadn't passed a budget in 2011 or 2010 either. This year is a presidential election. 2011 was an off year. 2010 was a midterm election. That covers every kind of year there is in Washington. By this standard, the Senate will have an annual excuse not to pass a budget resolution for the rest of time, close quote. I think there's a lot of truth to that. So they can't pass a budget this year. It's an election year. Well, last year wasn't. So this Sunday, April 29th, we'll have gone three full years since the last time the Senate Democrats have brought a budget to the floor of the Senate. Three years. They won't produce a plan in truth because they're unable to produce a plan. That they do seem to be, and it's hard, I have to admit. The House has done it, but the Senate seems to be unable to do it. They're not able to unite behind a financial vision for this country that they're p willing to go to the American people, advocate for, and publicly defend. Now, that's my view of it. Maybe that's unfair. I don't think so. Why not otherwise? So they can't put on paper how much they want the government uh, to grow, uh, how much they want to raise taxes, and how much deficit each year they're willing to accept, and whether that deficit is going to be brought under control uh, permanently or whether it will continue at the unsustainable rate it is. Oh, there have been a lot of secret meetings and um, discussions and floats about what might be involved uh, in an agreement that could or could not occur. There's been a lot of talk about that, but what's been carefully avoided is actually letting the American people see the numbers uh, so they can be totaled and we can know precisely the impact of it. Uh, last year, our colleagues um, uh, indicated we'd have a budget committee hearing on the budget, uh, that they had a plan, and it was going to be Monday, and then it was going to be Tuesday, and then the Democratic conference met, and uh, they laid out some outline, broad outline for it, uh, and then apparently they told Senator Conrad not to have a budget markup. So we didn't even have anything brought up in the budget committee last year as required by the law. Um, but you could, take an out, you could take a look at that budget it would have increased spending, not reduced spending. It would have increased taxes significantly, but would have managed to cut the Defense Department $900 billion. That's what the outlines of it appear to be. So I would ask, that's a pretty tough budget to go to the American people for. Increased spending, 
uh, and uh, increased taxes and savage the Defense Department. Well, I don't think that was very popular. Maybe politically it was foolish, as Senator Reid had said, to bring up such a budget to the American people. Uh, maybe they ought to look at the Ryan budget in the House. It's much more responsible. It reduces spending, uh, even simplifies and lowers taxes, creating a growth environment, uh, and it puts us on a financial path over the next 30 years that anybody that looks at America would say, wow, they've changed. They got a plan. They'll get them out of this fix that they're they're in. They they've gotten off the uh, uh, path to the waterfall, and and they're on a on a sound course now. So I'll encourage my colleagues who think that there's a legitimate reason not to lay out a plan, uh, not to uh, fight for the future of America, not to. Uh, a reason not to advocate for the kind of changes we all know that have got to occur. Uh, if you think those are, uh, are not important, uh, then I invite you to come to the floor and dispute what I've said and explain why we don't need to uh, move forward uh, as the law requires us to do. Um, Mr. President, I, I don't know how uh, things will happen, but as a ranking member of the Budget Committee uh, and seeing the numbers, I know that they're not going to be easily confronted. It is not going to be easy. We're going to have to look at the almost 60 percent of the budget now that's entitlements and interest on the debt. Interest on the debt, and I believe last year was calculated by the Congressional Budget Office uh, to go from $240 billion to over $900 billion under the President's budget. Annual interest payment on the trillions of dollars we now owe in debt, that's unsustainable. So I know it's not going to be easy. I would just say that uh, if we on the Republican side are honored with a majority in the Senate, uh, we will pass a budget. It will be an absolute duty as far as I can see for us to do so. And if so, it will be an honest budget. It will be a budget that won't be easy. And the American people may be surprised at some of the things that would be required to be accomplished, but it would put us on a path uh, to a financially prosperous America. Get us off the road to, to debt and decline. Put us on a path to uh, growth and prosperity. That's what we've got to have. And until the world financial community and the American people understand that we are on a good path and not a bad path. We're not going to see the economic growth that we should be seeing. And it's through growth and prosperity and more jobs that we'll pay more taxes. Uh, it uh, will we'll, uh, be through those actions that will put America on the way to meet the great challenge of our time. I thank the chair and would yield the floor. Since I'm a court. Will the senator withhold his request? Uh, I ask to uh, withdraw the request, Mr. President. The senator from Wisconsin is recognized. Uh, Mr. President, I ask for unanimous consent to speak for not to exceed the 15 minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I come to the floor today to mark an amazing anniversary. Uh, and, I, and by amazing, I don't mean good, I mean unbelievable, I mean sad. On Sunday, we will mark the anniversary, April 29th, of the date where it's been three years since the United States Senate has passed a budget. I know a lot of American, Americans have heard that date. They've heard the talking point that it's been a thousand umpteen days since we passed a budget. But it's not just a talking point. It's simply unbelievable. It's jaw-dropping. The United States government is the largest financial entity in the world and has been operating now for three years without a budget. It's a $3.8 trillion entity. Now, I come from the private sector. I'm an accountant. And when I tell the voters, the citizens of Wisconsin, that the federal government hasn't passed a budget, they really are amazed. That's why I call it an amazing anniversary date. 
The United States Senate has not fulfilled a basic responsibility. It is required by law to pass a budget by April 15th of every year. It's a reasonable requirement. It's a reasonable responsibility. The House of Republicans has fulfilled the responsibility. They've put forward a plan. They've shown the American people what they would do to solve our looming debt and deficit problem. The United States Senate hasn't. Why hasn't the majority here in the Senate passed a budget? They have all the votes. They have them in the Budget Committee to refer a budget to the floor. They have the votes, they have the number of members on the floor of the Senate to pass a budget. Why do they refuse? Is it because they have no solutions to our problem? Or is it they have a solution, they simply don't want the American people to know what it is? Trust us. We'll take care of us. Is it also because they don't want their fingerprints on that solution? They don't want to be held accountable. I think more likely that's the reason we haven't passed a budget here in the Senate for three years now. Now, I guess they could claim that President Obama's budget is their plan. But the problem with that is President Obama's last two budgets have been so unserious. Last year, his budget lost in this body, the United States Senate, by a vote of zero to 97. Not one member of the president's own party gave it a vote. As a matter of fact, not one member of the, party, of the president's own party was willing to bring that budget to the floor for a vote. Republicans had to do that. And now this year's budget, three weeks ago in the House of Representatives, again, the president's budget was brought forward to the House by a Republican, not a Democrat. It lost zero to 414. Again, I ask American people, think about that. Think about what a stunning repudiation that is of leadership. What it really represents is a total abdication of leadership. The American people deserve better. They deserve far better. They deserve to see a plan. They deserve to have a choice. The president now has put forward four budgets. He has yet to propose any solution to save Social Security or to save Medicare. Again, the House has provided that plan. They've passed a budget. They've been responsible. Republicans have been willing to be held accountable. That's our job. It is well past time for the United States Senate to fulfill its responsibility, to bring a budget to the floor, not just vote on one, but to work on it and pass one so we can go to conference and we can reconcile that with the House budget so the United States finally, after three years, will start operating under a budget in the next fiscal year. Now, I know the Budget Control Act sets spending caps. I mean, I get that. Washington is going to make sure that it can start continue to spend money. But spending money is only half the equation. What is this body going to do in terms of showing the American people what our plan is to live within our means, to get our debt and deficit under control. The American people are waiting. The result of this embarrassing abdication of responsibility and leadership can be clearly described by a few charts. And let me start going through a couple. I think most people have seen all kinds of different debt charts. I like this one because it starts in 1987 when our total federal debt was $2.3 trillion. If we were to pass President Obama's budget and live by it, in 10 years, our total federal debt would be $25.9 trillion. In the Budget Control Act, this body, Congress, gave President Obama the authority to increase our, defs, our, our debt limit by $2.1 trillion. It took us 200 years to incur $2.3 trillion, we will have blown through that one point or that two point one trillion dollar debt ceiling increase in less than two years. Just in case anybody is still confused, we have a spending problem in this nation. It's not that we 
take too little from the American people, it's because we spend too much. I know the American people are frequently subjected to phrases like draconian cuts. I think this proves that we're not cutting anything. In 2002, the federal government spent $2 trillion. Last year, or the current fiscal year, it's projected we'll spend $3.8 trillion. We virtually doubled spending in just 10 years. And the argu argument moving forward is, according to President Obama, he would like to spend $5.8 trillion in the year 2022. The House budget would spend $4.9 trillion. Another way of looking at that is 10-year spending. In the 10-year period from 1992 to 2001, the federal government spent a total of $16 trillion. From 2002 through 2011, the federal government spent $28 trillion. And again, the argument moving forward is President Obama's budget in 10 years would spend $47 trillion. The House budget proposes spending $40 trillion. Now, you don't have to be a math major or an engineer to do that math. Both 40 and 47 trillion dollars is greater than 28 trillion. We're not cutting spending, we're just trying to reduce the rate of growth. And that's an incredibly important distinction. Don't be misled. We're trying to get our debt and deficit under control. You know, a few months ago, or a couple months ago, President Obama said he had the solution. His Buffett rule was going to stabilize the debt and deficit. Here's a little history. I hope the American people look at this. President Bush, in his first four years in office, ran a total deficit of, of $0.8 trillion, $800 billion. Now, back in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, I wasn't happy with that result. I didn't like seeing that deficit spending. His second two years didn't improve, or his, his second four years. He had a total deficit of $1.2 trillion between the years of 2005 and 2008. Again, I don't think there are very many fiscal conservatives that were happy with that result. But now President Obama has increased that dramatically. During the four years of his administration, the total deficit will be $5.3 trillion. That's on total spending of about $14.4 trillion. We are borrowing 37 cents of every dollar we spend and our debt now exceeds the size of our economy. And again, the President, President Obama's solution, I realize this is hard to see, but he's proposed the, the Buffett tax. If we were to actually enact that tax, over four years, it would have raised $20 billion. I know you really can't see it, but there really is a line there. It, do, it doesn't even fill in the, the uh, marker lines here. $20 billion to solve a $5,300 billion problem. I'm sorry, that's not a serious proposal. It's just class warfare. Let me show you one of the problems that President Obama refuses to address. The looming bankruptcy of our Social Security program. The program that millions of seniors rely on. That Americans plan their retirement around. You hear all kinds of times, you hear it frequently that, oh, that Social Security is solvent to the year 2035. No, it's not. It's solvent because of an accounting fiction called the trust fund, which is simply government bonds held by the government. The analogy I use, it's like you had $20 and you spend the $20 and you write yourself a note and you put it in your pocket and say, I got 20 bucks. No, you don't nor does the federal government. It has bonds, which by the way, it can print any day of the week, but it has to sell those bonds. Social Security went cash negative, which means it's paid out more in benefits than it took in in tax receipts in the year 2010 by about $51 billion. Last year, it was $46 billion in the deficit. Through the year 2035, all this red ink represents $6 trillion in additional deficit spending in the Social Security Fund. It's insolvent. It's bankrupt. It needs to be addressed. This president refuses to address it. <clears throat> when we project out and we see another 10 to $11 trillion worth of deficit spending and increased debt, according to President Obama's budget, 
I'm concerned that we're not even fully realizing the other risks involved in that. Before I get to this chart, let me first mention the, uh, the first one. If we fail to meet the growth targets that President Obama has projected in his budget by just 1 percent, you add $3.1 trillion to that 10-year deficit figure. That's a 30 percent increase. I know when they passed the health care law, the American people were told they were hoodwinked into believing it would actually reduce our deficit. It won't. The way they were going to pay for six years' worth of spending is with 10 years' worth of receipts and reductions in Medicare. Now, the receipts, by the way, come in taxes, fees, and penalties on, by the way, drug manufacturers, medical device manufacturers, health care plans. Now, I don't know what economics course members of this administration took, but you don't bend the cost curve down by increasing the costs to provide it. But that's what they were doing for about $590 billion of that revenue stream to pay for Obamacare. The other $665 billion was going to come out of cuts to Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and Medicaid. Now, we haven't imposed the provider reductions under the SGR fix, the DOC fix, about $208 billion. What makes anybody believe they will actually impose the $665 billion of savings in Medicare? If we move the 10-year window forward to when Obamacare really kicks in, when the full spending occurs starting about 2016, the total cost of the health care law won't be $1.1 trillion. It will be $2.4 trillion, and that's a conservative estimate. It's not even taking into account the millions of, of employers that will lose their employer-sponsored care and get put into the exchanges at highly subsidized rates. But using conservative cost figure, $2.4 trillion, grow the taxes, fees, and penalties by a reasonable amount, $816 billion, that leaves a $1.6 trillion, what I'm calling deficit risk. How is that going to be filled? Are we going to borrow it, or are we going to take it out of Medicare? Somehow I don't think we'll be taking it out of Medicare. Somehow I think we'll have to borrow it if we can. And that gets me, brings me to our last chart, interest rate risk. I was never concerned, not even for a moment, last year during the debt ceiling debate. The federal government was going to default on any of its obligations. We were going to pay. Social Security recipients. We were going to pay our soldiers. We were going to meet every obligation of the federal government. The day I fear is the true day of reckoning. The day when creditors around the world take a look at the United States and say, you know what? I'm not going to loan you any more money. Or what's more likely to occur is they're going to say, oh, I'll loan you some money, but not at these rates. If you take a look at the history of the borrowing costs of the United States from 1970 to the year 2000, our average borrowing cost for the federal government was 5.3 percent. Over the last three years, from 2010 to 2012, our average borrowing cost was about 1.5 percent. That's a difference of 3.8 percent between these two figures. If we just revert to that average, and by the way, back, back then, the United States was a far more creditworthy borrower. Our debt to GDP ratio ranged somewhere between 45 percent and 67 percent. Currently, our debt to GDP ratio exceeds 100 percent. If we revert to that average borrowing cost of 5.3 percent, that would cost the federal government $600 billion in added interest expense per year. That's 60 percent of the discretionary spending level of a trillion forty-seven billion dollars this year. Senator has consumed 15 minutes. I ask you have unanimous consent for two more minutes. Without objection. Thank you. So here's the problem. This is a huge problem. It's one that's being ignored because we simply refuse to address it. This body refuses to pass a budget to lay out a plan to fix it, to stabilize one of our primary metrics, a key one, is that debt to GDP ratio. Stabilize that and start bringing it down. And I would argue the other key metric, probably even more important, is the percentage of government in relationship to the size of our economy. A hundred years ago, that was 2 percent. 
Last year was about 24 percent, which means 24 cents of every dollar filters through some form of government. And I don't know about you, but I do not find the federal government particularly effective or efficient. That's what the private sector does. It's the private sector that creates long-term self-sustaining jobs. It's the private sector that we need to rely on to grow our economy and create jobs. The vision for America, we are going to have a very clear choice on the vision for America between what this administration wants to do with a government-centered society and what Republicans want to do in terms of an opportunity society led by free people, free enterprise, led by freedom. That's our choice. But until the majority party here in the Senate lays out their plan, the American people won't have a choice. They won't understand what the plan is from the other side. So again, let me just close by saying it is well past time for the United States Senate to fulfill its responsibility and pass a budget. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. I right, note the answer of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Senator from Arizona is recognized. Mr. President, uh, I rise today to discuss the Senate's violence. Senate currently in a quorum call. Oh, I ask unanimous consent that former uh, proceedings on the quorum call be suspended, and I without ask objection. that I be allowed to. How much time do I have remaining? Nine, nine, uh, close to ten minutes. Fourteen minutes. Fourteen minutes. Approximately fourteen minutes. I thank you, Mr. President. Today I rise to discuss the Violence Against Women Act and the policies that impact the lives of women. Since its original enactment in 1994, the Violence Against Women Act has been reauthorized twice by unanimous consent under both Democrat and Republican leadership. The legislation originated out of a necessity for us to respond to the prevalence of domestic violence, sexual violence, and the impact those crimes have on the lives of women. By and large, the legislation has worked even though there are outstanding issues like spending inefficiencies and needed improvements to oversight. As with most large pieces of legislation, including the Violence Against Women Act, reauthorization before us, that will shortly be before us, there are debates and philosophical differences about elements of various provisions in the bill. And while the Senate should be allowed to debate and ideally resolve the, these differences, I don't think any of the points of controversy we will discuss are important enough to prevent passage of the legislation. The Violence Against Women Act represents a national commitment to reversing the legacy of laws and social norms that once served to shamefully excuse violence towards women, a commitment that should be maintained. Whatever differences we might have over particular provisions in the bill, Surely we are united in our concern for the victims of violence and our determination to do all that we can to, to prevent violence against the innocent, regardless of gender. I recognize that women suffer disproportionately from, from particular forms of violence and other abuse, which this legislation is intended to, dread, to address, and I believe does address, and that's why I support it. But our motivation to act on their behalf resides in our respect for the rights all human beings possess, male and female, all races, creeds, and ages, to be secure in their persons and property, to be protected by their government from, from violent harm at the hands of another, to live without threat or fear in the exercise of their God-given rights. Similarly, Whatever our political differences in this body, I trust we all believe we are doing what we think best serves the interests and values of the American people, all of the American people. I don't think either party is entitled to speak or act exclusively 
for one demographic of our population, one class, one race, or one gender. The security and prosperity of all Americans is a shared responsibility, and each of us discharges it to the best of our ability. We don't have male and female political parties, and we don't need to accuse each other of caring less for the concerns of one half of the population than we do for the other half. The truth is both parties have presided over achievements and increases in opportunity for women. Both parties have nominated women to the Supreme Court. Both parties have had excellent female secretaries of state. Both parties have had female, and presid female presidential and vice presidential candidate. Both parties have reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act. Both parties have made progress towards ensuring Americans, male and female, have an equal opportunity to succeed as far as their talents and industry can take them. That progress has come in the form of many policies, from changes to our tax codes, to changes in education policy, to improvements in workplace environments, as well as from changes in cultural attitudes in both the public and the private sector. Do we always agree? Do we always get it right? No, we don't. But I do think there is much for all of us to be proud of. Regrettably, and there's always something to regret in politics, we have seen too many attempts to resolve inequities in our society and ensure all Americans are afforded the same respect for their rights and aspirations misappropriated for the purpose of partisan advantage, which has the perverse effect, of course, of dividing the country in the name of greater fairness and unity. My friends, this supposed war on women or the use of similarly outlandish rhetoric by partisan operatives has two purposes and both are political in their purpose and effect. The first, purely political. The first is to distract citizens from real issues that really matter and the second is to give talking heads something to sputter about when they appear on cable television. Neither purpose does anything to advance the well-being of any American. I've been fortunate to be influenced throughout my life by the example of strong, independent, aspiring, and caring women. As a son, brother, husband, father, and grandfather, I think I can claim some familiarity with the contributions women make to the health and progress of our society. I can certainly speak to their beneficial impact on my life and character. But I'd never claim to speak for all the women in my family, much less all the women in our country, any more than I would venture the same presumption for all men. To suggest that one group of us or one party speaks for all women or that one group has an agenda to harm women and another to help them is ridiculous. If for no other reason, then it assumes a unity of interests, beliefs, concerns, experiences, and ambition among all women that doesn't exist among men or among any race or class. It would be absurd for me to speak for all veterans and wrong of me to suggest that if a colleague who isn't a veteran disagrees my, with my opinion on some issue, he or she must be against all our veterans. In America, we can fairly claim to have in common with each other at all times, no matter what gender we are or what demographic we fit, are our rights. As a son, brother, husband, father, and grandfather, I have the same dreams and concerns for all the people in my life. As a public servant, I have the same respect for their rights and the same responsibility to protect them and I try to do so to the best of my ability. Thankfully, I believe women and men in our country are smart enough to recognize that when a politician or political party resorts to dividing us in the name of bringing us together, it usually means that they are either out of ideas or short on resolve to address the challenges of our time. At this time in our nation's history, 
We face an abundance of hard choices. Divisive slogans and the declaring of phony wars are intended to avoid those hard choices and to escape paying a political price for doing so. For 38 straight months, our unemployment rate has been over 8 percent. Millions of Americans, men and women, cannot find a job. Many have quit looking. Americans don't need another hollow slogan or another call to division and partisanship. They need real solutions to their problems. They are desperate for them. Americans of both genders are concerned about finding and keeping a good job. Americans of both genders are concerned about the direction of our economy. Women and men are concerned about mounting debt, their own and the nation's. Women and men are hurt by high gas prices, by the housing crisis, shrinking wages, and the cost of health care. Women and men are concerned about their children's security, their education, their prospects for inheriting an America that offers every mother and father's child a decent chance at reaching their full potential. Leaving these problems unaddressed indefinitely and resorting to provoking greater divisions among us at a time when we most need unity might not be a war against this or that group of Americans, but it is surely a surrender. A surrender of our responsibilities to the country and a surrender of decency. Within the tired suggestions that women are singularly focused on one or two issues are the echoes of stale arguments from the past. Women are as variable in their opinions and concerns as men. Those false assertions are rooted in the past stereotypes that prevented women from becoming whatever they wanted to become, which slowed our progress and hurt our country in many ways. The argument is as wrong now as it was then, and we ought not to repeat it. We only have these in common, our equal right to the pursuit of happiness and our shared responsibility to making America an even greater place than we found it. Women and men are no different in their rights and responsibilities. I believe this legislation recognizes that. I don't believe the ludicrous partisan posturing that has conjured up this imaginary war does. I yield the floor. Mr. Senator from Minnesota is recognized. Uh, Mr. President, uh, a group of us, uh, women senators, are here today to talk about the Violence Against Women bill.